all the work I'm presenting, it will be focused on my lab's interests. Uh, so let me tell you right away, it's not going to be like a complete overview of all the biology and bi biochemistry of secretion systems. That's going to be very hard to do, even though Robson has given me a, a fairly uh, long time slot, which I guess I would end up using entirely. So all this work has been possible primarily due to uh, members of my group and collaborators who are named here in um, at least the members of my group, the order in which they join my group. Yeah, that's how they are named. And uh, then my collaborators are down here. So what we shall be talking about would be uh, looking at these secretion systems uh, from the viewpoint of evolutionary principles. So in a sense, it would be a lesson on how to interpret molecular systems with an evolutionary lens and how applying that lens can help you see through certain things. Because when you look at a complex molecular system or a molecular machine, it's an aggregate of a large number of proteins and sometimes nucleic acids and other molecules in addition. So what, of, what part of that is really important or what part of that is the essence of the system? Uh, to get to the bottom of that, we need to have an evolutionary approach and that's primarily the line I would be taking in today's talk. So the first issue when we come to secretion is why do we why do we have secretion in the first place and the answer to that is intimately tied to the very question of what life is now uh, from our current understanding we imagine life as emerging at some point whether it was on earth or on some other planetary body elsewhere uh, in the universe uh, through a system of replicators which uh, in our case comprises of nucleic acids replicated by proteins. Now it's quite possible that in the earliest days, nucleic acids were replicating themselves. So to move from this uh, state of self-replicating molecules, either in a single cycle, that is a nucleic acid replicating itself or nucleic acid templating a protein and the protein then making more nucleic acid, whichever way you imagine it, uh, for this molecular replicator system to move to what we uh, see as life, the most important thing is to have boundaries. Because in the absence of boundaries, your replicator enzyme or ribozyme will essentially be offering free services. And uh, any molecule that can replicate itself more efficiently will be selected for, and it would lead to a collapse of the system. So you need a degree of selfishness wherein the replication uh, is coupled to what makes the replicator. And uh, such a thing can happen only when you have a definition of public goods and private goods, wherein the replicator, that's the template, uh, and what it makes to replicate itself, the replicating enzyme, they are bounded off. So you need a boundary condition. So boundaries make life. The moment you talk about a boundary, you're faced with a second issue. And uh, the second issue is a, a bounded system is a finite system. But for the process of replication, which by definition implies making more copies, you need an inflow of uh, molecules into the system. And in all likelihood, you also need an outflow because there would be byproducts which you may not need, which you need to release into the environment. So you cannot have a completely closed system uh, in life. So by definition, you need a semi-permeable system. And the moment you start talking about a semi-permeable system, you're confronted with the problem of secretion and transport. Moreover, any such early system of life would have not been an island. It would be uh, undergoing agonistic interactions, which means uh, cooperative interactions with others like itself, that's kin, and antagonistic interaction probably with non-kin. So uh, you need 
some way to communicate to the outside world in addition to just getting the raw materials so all of these imply that for the emergence of life uh, another precondition is the need for transport across the boundary which is what we term secretion so given this uh, first principles background uh, there may be a few things which you would like to think about and uh, some of this uh, is probably stuff which you are well aware of but at the risk of uh, being redundant i'll still repeat it because it's good to have this background in mind when we are talking of these systems so as far as we can see all life on earth has descended to some approximation from one common ancestral cell and we call that a last common ancestor from which the extant life has descended as the luca or the last universal common ancestor so this term the luca is something i would be using uh, repeatedly in my talk now you could ask some other questions today all cells have uh, lipid membranes while the exact composition of the lipid may differ uh, from organism to organism for example the archaeal lipids ether lipids are very different from ester lipids seen in bacteria for example uh, but the the bottom line is they have a hydrophobic lipid layer bounding their cells so given this kind of a boundary one question you could ask is was a lipid boundary ancestral to all life forms another question you can ask is uh, we have viruses today and these viruses uh, in most part the primitive viruses or the ancestral state of the virus can be reconstructed as a protein shell being the boundary of the system so was this the alternative ancestral state and uh, you can ask do you think there was a transport system would you expect a transport system to have been there in the luca and if so how you would infer it and when you talk of replicators you have some other uh, cellular processes which become essential when you replicate uh, the nucleic acid it's essentially replication of the chromosome so is that chromosome going to remain in the same compartment as the other chromosome then the whole purpose of uh, life is lost you need to replicate the compartment itself so does this process of chromosome segregation have some connection to transport that's uh, yet another point which you can think about so i am just putting this out there so that uh, it may spark some thought i will be discussing the answers uh, to some of these it's not that we know everything but uh, we can uh, look at the end of the talk to see how much we understand of some of these questions now the focus of this talk would be bacterial secretion uh, though uh, i do have the final part which will be on eukaryotic uh, secretion or extrusion of molecules and in the talk i will uh, bring up some parallels to eukaryotic systems still the focus is going to be bacterial and the reason for this is primarily because the field of secretion emerged as an interest uh, as a byproduct of the interest in bacterial pathogenesis so an important aspect of bacterial pathogenesis is the delivery of effectors or toxins from the bacterial cell into the host cell or the target cell uh biotechnology is another cause for this interest because production of enzymes and other proteins uh, using bacterial uh, systems means that you need to get these out of the cell so uh, the focus on the cell uh, the secretion systems has been intense uh, it's increasingly becoming an important player in understanding the ecology of microbes because uh, bacterial conflicts involve the use of secreted effectors and here again the secretion systems become uh, important and in, uh, finally we have had a long history of uh, model systems of bacterial uh, origin so that again makes the focus on bacterial secretion including the very common model system e coli escherichia coli or bacillus subtilis each of these offers a window into several secretion systems uh, unlike something like yeast the eukaryotic model which may not have that much to offer in terms of uh, secretion 
So the way I'm going to cover this uh, discussion is going to be uh, give a very brief overview of the diversity of secretory systems, and then uh, delve into the delve upon the evolutionary um, principles behind them and some of the inferences which we have been able to uh, make uh, using those first principles. So here is a table illustrating some uh, bacterial secretion systems, which are very prevalent. By no means is this uh, exhaustive. Uh, what I mean by that is there are uh, secretion systems beyond this. Uh, but these are very common ones uh, on which uh, you will find a large body of literature, including uh, several excellent reviews. But uh, what I want you all to focus on, or the, what I've condensed uh, out here, is the existence of some kind of a signal. Uh, and this signal can be defined as a tag or some imprint in the polypeptide, uh, which tells the polypeptide or tells the cell that this polypeptide must go out of the cell. Then there's the whole issue of whether the polypeptide is folded or not, and we'll come to this in a moment. And the kind of cell type that is, as uh, you all know, and this is an important point to keep in mind, that bacteria have different kinds of uh, external surfaces. And I'll elaborate on that uh, again down the line. And here in this column, you have something called the principal engine. Now, what I mean by an engine is uh, sort of in a thermodynamic sense, that is any molecule that can extract free energy from, say, NTP hydrolysis and drive uh, the export process, uh, that would be termed as an engine. Now, the way this NTP hydrolysis is utilized can be very different between these systems, and that will be a huge uh, part of our discussion today. So. At the heart of it, we had this issue of folded versus unfolded. And that, in many ways, is really the whole heart of the secretion problem. So uh, I can just caricature it by saying that essentially it boils down to Euclidean geometry. So here you have a circle, and here you have a line. The perimeter of this circle uh, that is going all around it, the length, is the same as this line. Now ask yourself. Which of these would be easier to get out between these two lines? So essentially, you can boil down the secretion problem to such a geometric problem. And all the evolutionary process has been, or a large part of the evolutionary process has been selection around this process. And you'll shortly see why that is so. Now, as I mentioned uh, in that table, one of the issues which a cell faces is what goes out and what does not. For example, there is no point putting out your RNA polymerase, which it needs to remain inside the cell. Whereas if you have an enzyme like an amylase and you want to uh, degrade a carbohydrate in your environment to get in your sugars, that needs to go out. So the key point is one of the constraints which the evolution of any select of any secretion system would face is the emergence of some kind of a tag which is some form of a peptide signal within the polypeptide which is going out which can be recognized and it can be like uh, what in the us they call a zip code uh, which will say that this has to go outside the cell uh, so it's like a postal address which is telling you that this has to go outside the cell. Now, if you have a tag on a protein, that tag may not necessarily play a role in the function of the rest of the polypeptide. In fact, it may even interfere with the function of the rest of the polypeptide because its primary role is to tell you that this thing has to go outside. So that tag needs to be removed once the function of uh, secretion or going outside is solved. So this essential selective pressure has selected repeatedly for two distinct features in secretory systems. And uh, independent origins of these uh, uh, kinds of elements can be seen throughout. One is the tag itself. 
So the most common tag which you all may be familiar with is what's called the signal peptide. And the signal peptide is a hydrophobic tag. And you can see why that makes sense because the membrane itself is hydrophobic. So the simplest way you can tell something is to go towards the membrane for it to be secreted out is to have a hydrophobic tag like a signal peptide. And then you need to remove the tag. And these are commonly termed signal peptidases. These are proteolytic enzymes which will cleave off the tag once uh, the job of targeting it to the exterior is done. Now, beyond that, you have some other uh, evolutionary constraints. First, we saw that, uh, going back to that previous slide, the circle versus line analogy. Now, the circle is obviously going to have greater difficulty going out because you can turn this line around and pass it through. What that means in practical terms is that the tendency of most proteins, especially enzymes or binding proteins, is to acquire a globular configuration. It means a folded, uh, relatively stable fold. Uh, so for that fold, that's the natural tendency of the protein. So that can be approximated by that circle. Now, when you have a boundary to a cell, one of the situation, one of the things is you cannot have very wide pores. The existence of very wide pores defeats the very purpose of having a boundary because it essentially equilibrates the environment with the interior. So the pores necessarily have to be of small diameter, which means that the completely folded protein, for most part, is going to be like that circle which you cannot push through that narrow pore. And that implies that the protein has to go out of the cell in the unfolded configuration for most part in a very uh, common secretory system, unless you have some specialized mechanism for taking it out in an unfold, in a completely folded way. Uh, for most part, it is going to be uh, the first, at least the primary secretion step is going to be in an unfolded way. And because the natural tendency of the protein is to collapse into a folded state, you need to have a chaperone, which will keep it unfolded until it goes out. And this might sometimes require energy because uh, you're going against the flow, against the thermodynamic flow of natural folding uh, to unfold the protein so that once it's unfolded, it will be more or less in an extended configuration and you can send it out to the pore. And then when you get it to the other side, uh, you will have the reverse issue. So it will probably fold for most part into its native configuration or confirmation. But uh, some proteins may not necessarily fold the way they have to fold. So you may need a refolding chaperone on the exterior too. Uh, then there is another step where you may require energy. Crossing the membrane is probably going to be against a certain gradient. And in that event, uh, you would need to force that peptide through the membrane. And that would be an energetically uh, active process. That is, it will be energy demanding. So this is these are two places where the cellular energy currency, typically in the form of ATP, might be con um, consumed. So a very important feature by from first principles, which you would predict as being common across secretory systems, is something called an NTPase or most commonly an ATPase, that is, which uses NTP, typically ATP, to drive unfolding as well as transport across the membrane. Now, there are some other constraints, and these relate to the structure of the bacterial cell wall, which I alluded to in the table. So most uh, bacteria in their primitive state, you may say, have the cell membrane, like all cells, all living cells do. And additionally, bacteria have a further shell around the cell membrane, which is uh, made up of peptidoglycan, also termed murine. Now, this uh, uh, peptidoglycan layer is quite porous. So once you get it across the membrane, it may embed in that or it may get past it. <coughs> so 
the, the again there are multiple possibilities you may want to have a part of the protein which is outside and embed the rest of it in the membrane alternatively you would be secreting things outside into the exterior and then there is a second type of bacterial surface and you see this in the type of bacteria which are called gram negative bacteria so the, this type are term gram positive the term gram negative and gram positive is a legacy from old microbiology where uh, certain kind of staining techniques uh, would cause these type of cell walls to take up a certain stain and you know which was made by uh, a microbiologist by the name gram and that uh, stain uh, once it stain these cell walls or cell surfaces it would make them gram positive whereas that stain could be washed off in these kind of uh, cell surfaces and so they were termed gram negative so the our common uh, model systems like say escherichia coli the the proteobacteria all of them have this gram negative kind of cell uh, surface whereas a model system like bacillus subtilis uh actinomycetes all of them have this kind of gram positive cell surface so in what structurally sets apart the gram negative cell surfaces is that they have a second membrane which is of a distinct composition from the cell membrane and that's called the outer membrane so in this case you don't just uh, have to get the protein into this space between the two membranes or in, into the peptidoglycan but you may if you want to get it truly outside uh, you'll have to transverse the second membrane too uh, finally in the case of uh, pathogenic and predatory bacteria you may not just have to cross two membranes if it were gram negative but you may have to cross a third or fourth membrane uh, if you have to deliver it into your target cell so like eukaryotes uh, could be one target cell and if you have to get it into the eukaryotic cell uh, you would have to cross that membrane too now another issue is you may not want these uh, transport processes to happen all the time because especially for a pa pathogenic or a parasitic uh, bacterium uh it may need this kind of secretion only when it's inside the host cell or when it is uh, attaching to the host cell so these uh, uh secretory systems at least a subset of them could be uh, facultative so you have the issue of assembly and disassembly and you can think about which process is more likely to need energy hello Yes. Uh, we are. Uh, are you? Are you? Do, are you hearing me fine? Yes. Okay. Great. I just see uh, a problem with this. Uh, oh, okay. That's fine. I just had some uh, background noise, so I was just hoping that my connection didn't uh, uh, fail. Uh, just checking. Sorry. Yeah. Let me continue. Uh, okay. So. one approach to see what was the most ancestral version of secretion is to just look at all living life forms and to see what kind of secretion system is common to all living cells and uh, there is a little evolutionary uh, question in this regard which you need to be uh, aware of hello yes continue yeah. okay okay yeah uh, which you need to be aware of which is uh, what we call the standard model evolutionary tree so looking at highly conserved molecules like say uh, ribosomal proteins and uh, amino acyl tRNA synthetases uh, certain very well conserved chaperones like the hsp60 super family so all these are what may be termed universal proteins so when you use those to construct the phylogenetic tree of life uh, we get what may be termed the standard model briefly put it posits a fundamental split in life between bacteria and archaea uh, 
and within archaea probably as a sister group to a subset of archaea which have recently been termed asgard archaeota uh, the eukaryotes emerge and this step of eukaryogenesis uh, seems to have gone hand in hand with an important endosymbiotic event wherein alpha proteobacteria from the bacterial lineage entered an asgard archaeal cell to found the ancestral eukaryote and that uh, alpha proteobacterium persists as the mitochondrion so uh, if you have a protein and you construct a phylogenetic tree using its sequences and it gives you this kind of a topology a tree topology something approximating this then you may infer that it was very likely present in the luca or it was inherited from the last universal common ancestor and when we look at the secretory system what is called the general secretory system or the sex system it has a set of five proteins which we can trace back to the luca and these are the signal recognition particle and this one comes along with the rna which can similarly be traced back and that's an interesting point to note uh it the signal recognition particle receptor or fdsy and these transmembrane proteins which are part of the secretory apparatus so what exactly are they doing when we look at the, their functions it gives you a picture of how this secretory system may have functioned in the luca so those three transmembrane proteins they constitute what may be called a translocase or a translocator system right on the membrane and on the cytoplasmic side you have these two gtpases srp and sr they are parallelous gtpases that means they have evolved from a common um, a recent a relatively recent common ancestor and the difference between them is that srp is the one which initially captures the signal peptide as the nascent polypeptide is coming out from the ribosome and uh, this signal recognition uh, receptor that serves as a docking enzyme or which or a docking protein it is an enzyme which uh, allows this srp bound uh, secrete protein to be secreted with the signal peptide to dock onto this translocase com complex thus it is directed into the pore for secretion and thus the um, protein reaches its destination on the membrane it may remain in the membrane or it may go out now the point of interest is this gtpas because that is the most conserved component in terms of sequence similarity of all these and it has a very interesting structure two non catalytic domains an n terminal domain fully alpha helical and likewise a c terminal domain term n m which is entirely alpha helical and you have uh, the central gtpas domain now the signal recognition particle receptor is a very related gtpas but it doesn't have the c terminal domain the c terminal domain binds something which is called the 7s rna or the signal recognition particle rna and uh, together these uh, recognize the signal peptide so it's rather remarkable that in this system which is universal across life forms and thus traceable to the luca you have a rna component which is right in the signal recognition system so uh, that gives us a hint that perhaps this system which we see in the luca has a much deeper root going back to what has been termed the rna world when uh, perhaps the genomes were primarily rna in nature or at least they had there was a rna phase uh, in the replicators and rnas were more prevalent at that point in functional terms and some of them have been fossilized like in the ribosome itself the enzyme or the ribozyme which makes proteins is a rna molecule and notably here in the secretory process the assembly of this key signal recognition enzyme is uh, based on a structural 
RNA, which uh, is required for the recognition of that signal. So here we are getting uh, a glimpse of the earliest secretory apparatus, which predates the LUCA in the form uh, of this RNA containing system. Now, these, this GTPS, which you see uh, right here, uh, that is the engine in a sense which drives this secretory system. So let's focus on this and try to understand uh, its broader history a little more. Now, there are at least 20 or more folds which recognize NTPs, that is ATP or GTP such molecules uh, in a cell. But the a fold, by what I mean by a fold, is a, a distinct protein structure, a distinct protein geometry, which typically defines a common origin. So here you have a fold which is almost entirely alpha helical. Here you have a fold which has a regular repeating pattern of alpha and beta elements. So these are called alpha slash beta folds broadly. And here you have segregated beta elements with uh, alpha helices. So these are called alpha plus beta. Here is another such. So <clears throat> and in many different folds, we have seen the emergence of NTP binding. But there is one fold amidst them which stands out. And that one is the P-loop fold. It, uh, in a very essential sense, has a topology of these strand helix units like that, like what's shown here. Uh, a regular repeating pattern of beta-alpha units. And there are two features which set apart these P-loop NTPS folds. One is this loop between the first beta and helix element. And this one is uh, the one which binds NTP. And then you have uh, this thing called the Walker B motif, which comes in, the, in a strand spatially adjacent to this P-loop uh, motif. And that binds a magnesium ion, Mg2+, which is required for the catalytic activity. So these GTPases, which we just saw, are a part of that fold. And by reconstructing its history, what we found is that there was a fundamental split into what we term the ASCII division. Uh, this is for additional strand conserved glutamate. So they have an additional glutamate in this Walker B region. <coughs> and they have an additional strand inserted spatially uh, in the, between the P-loop and this Walker B. This additional strand serves as a sensor for the state of the nucleotide. And this uh, glutamate uh, makes these enzymes way more efficient because it has a greater capacity, it acts as a general base, if, you're, if you recall your chemistry. Uh, so it improves the catalysis uh, of, uh, NT, of the NTPA's activity of these enzymes. Now, on the other side, you, where you have the GTPases, uh, they evolved a special, they, there are two groups within this, the kinases, which transfer phosphate moieties to other substrates, and the GTPases. Uh, and some of the GTPases possess that, that phosphate phosphotransfer activity, suggesting that that was the ancestral uh, uh, activity of this group. But what sets aside the GTPases is this motif uh, present in the fifth strand, typically termed the NKXD motif for asparagine, lysine, and uh, then it can be any amino acid and an aspartate. And this motif plays a very specific role in the recognition of the guanine mo moiety of GTP. Thus, these are specific for GTP, whereas these are quite agnostic. And since ATP is in much higher concentration than GTP in the cell, typically they use um, ATP. So this is the broad division. And uh, when we go to the, this is just elaborating that a little more. There are many different types within the ASCII group, like the A plus superfamily, which or family, which we'll talk about, the ABC family, which we'll talk about. And on the GTPA side, you similarly have uh, at least two great divisions, which we term the Semibi GTPases and the Trafac GTPases. These are called Trafac because 
they expanded in the context of translation factors early in evolution and we'll see that shortly so this is the tree which we reconstructed for the whole gtps clade and we show this in the form of a temporal diagram so here is the luca and here are the extinct organisms and these are some temporal uh, layers of major events like say when the archaea and bacteria first split up and uh, the origin of the eukaryotes uh, through that endosymbiotic event what could one could term the uh, crown eukaryotes like animals fungi plants those kinds of lineages now and with respect to that the branching events of the gtps tree are shown here and what you see is that the signal recognition particle and its receptor had diverged from each other even before the luca and you notice that there are many branches of gtpases spanning both these two great clades of gtpases which go past the luca which means that even before the last universal common ancestor you had a large number of diversification events duplication and divergence events amidst these gtpases and both the signal recognition particle and its receptor had separated from each other even before the last universal common ancestor so that suggests that this the core of this general secretory system had a very deep root uh, which predates uh, at least 3.8 billion years because that's what we would place uh, based on fossil evidence luca on earth and you can imagine the divergence time for these events so in a sense these suggest that uh, it's possible that life was even older than the age of the earth and that's an interesting consequence which i won't uh, elaborate on but just leave you all to think about what it might mean uh, but the other uh, but just another point to key, to take home here is that you see that at some point there these would have been the same protein before their divergence so what that would imply is that a, a single protein was playing both the role of the receptor and uh, the uh, recognition enzyme in this or in an ancient secretory process so you can very well imagine it going back to the rna world uh, in a certain primitive form which might explain that 7s rna now in bacteria an interesting development happened beyond this basic uh, sex system which can be traced back to the last universal common ancestor the bacteria evolved their own unique components of the sex system which are even more dominant than that ancestral one for secreting most proteins the ancestral one for most part is used for putting proteins on the membrane rather than driving them out into the periplasmic uh, space and this new sex system uh, of the bacteria has an interesting origin in that uh, the primary atpas which drives the translocation across the ancestral translocator system which comes from the luca is this new atps called sec a and sec a works in combination with a chaperone called sec b the sec b is an atp independent chaperone or energy free chaperone so what it means is that it doesn't unwind the protein but as the protein is coming out of the ribosome and before it is folded the sec b chaperone keeps it in that unfolded phase or unfolded state uh, which can then be captured by sec a and driven out uh, in an energy dependent process which consumes atp through the membrane now when we look at the sec atps uh, we find something very interesting it belongs to a super family of uh, ntpases of those p loop ntpases termed the super family 2 helicases now the super family 2 helicases can also be traced back to the luca where there were at least two distinct clades and those luca versions were definitely involved in nucleic acid dynamics that's why they are called helicases essentially they unwind they denature 
the strands of double stranded nucleic acids so they are central to both uh, dna repair as well as rna manipulation events where uh, there's a unwinding of double stranded rna and these have two p loop ntps domains of which the n terminal domain binds the ntp as all other p loop ntps domains uh, but the second p loop ntps domain it has become inactive and it instead supplies something called an arginine finger this arginine finger is a conserved arginine which stabilizes the hyper uh, charged intermediate a pentavalent phosphate uh, intermediate which is formed uh, during the hydrolysis of atp so by stabilizing that it improves the catalytic efficiency so what has happened here is you have an ancestral enzyme which worked in nucleic acid unwinding which has now been secondarily adapted in only the bacterial lineage as an enzyme which instead unwinds proteins or translocates uh, unfolded proteins across the membrane so again you see a ancient nucleic acid connection uh, just like you saw for the luca component of the signal recognition particle which bound rna so this is a point a persistent theme which we will develop through the rest of this talk but before we go there uh, let's look at something which uh, will tell us why so many secretion systems in bacteria and this brings us to the concept of the arms race now uh, darwin darwin had a friend or perhaps even a neighbor uh, who was a famous british poet uh, alfred tennyson and he had this uh, after a discussion with darwin he came up with this very interesting line uh, which he incorporated into a poem uh, which is red in tooth and claw so in essence he summarized darwin's idea of uh, life that at every level there are what may be termed biological conflicts some of these are very apparent to all of us prey and predator host and pathogen but uh, it uh, it doesn't stop there in that there's a complex flow of genetic information due to these uh, interactions for example you have predation in vertebrates being eaten by vertebrates which was probably the conduit for invertebrate nidoviruses to be uh, established in vertebrates and right now we are suffering uh, quite a bit from one of these very uh, nidoviruses which got uh, established uh, in vertebrates so uh, these different levels of biological conflict can uh, meld into each other or flow into each other and uh, they even at the molecular level we see that they span many layers of organization so the prey predator ones they can be put in the general category of interorganismal conflict and at the molecular level a common weapon reused in this kind of conflict are protein toxins uh the next level you have a uh, kin versus non kin so even within a population uh, if you favor your kin you're in a sense furthering a part of your own genes so you want to make sure that the resources go to your kin rather than non kin so there are a whole set of conflict systems which support that even within a cell you can have conflict because there are elements such as plasmids some of which may be free loaders so they are in conflict with the cellular genome so this can be termed an intracellular conflict now even within the genome you can have conflict there are systems like transposons um, toxin anti toxin systems which are essentially selfish they are just making more copies of themselves thus they are con in conflict with the genome uh, which they reside in which they are part of so conflict is multi level but what's the uni unifying feature of these biological conflicts and this is uh, where my research took an interesting turn so since 1997 uh in my lab we have been looking at nucleases i have had a long standing interest in trying to discover new nucleases uh 
through uh, computational analysis, that is through sequence analysis. And here are a list of some of the major successes which we had. And what we realized in course of studying these nucleases is that targeting uh, the flow of genetic information is a very widespread strategy used in these biological conflicts. So, for example, even in prey-predator relationships, uh, one of the snake toxins is a potent uh, phosphodiesterase, which can degrade both DNA and RNA. And down to the microbial level, we have uh, things like, uh, say, the RNA sarsin made by the fungus aspergillus, which can target our RNA. And between bacteria, the skin versus non-kin conflict is mediated uh, by these, in part, by uh, a variety of toxins known as colicins, several of which target DNA or RNA. And uh, anti-predation tactics of plants, they again use nucleic acid targeting enzymes, but here with a slight twist, instead of targeting the backbone of nucleic acids, which are nucleases, they may clip off the bases directly. That is, they are glycosidases. They break the end glycosidic linkage by which the base is connected to the backbone of the nucleic acid. So ricin, which is a widely known toxin from the castor plant, which has also been used as a biological weapon, is uh, one such uh, toxin. So what happened in course of uh, the research in my group was that we stumbled upon a, a diverse class of bacterial nucleases, which have this uh, very distinctive metal-dependent endonuclease fold called a HNH uh, or the T4 endonuclease 7 like fold. So they have some strategically placed histidines, uh, which chelate a metal ion, which is required for the endonucleolytic cleavage. Now, the earlier set of enzymes which we had discovered uh, through computational analysis as belonging to this uh, superfamily uh, included things like viral holiday junction resolvases and restriction enzymes. So these are all inside the cell. But interestingly, we found a set which didn't seem to show any signs of being in restriction modification or repair systems, and they were combined with some domains which are found only in secreted proteins, suggesting that they were extracellular. And when we looked closer at them, we found that they tended to be large proteins with a multipartite organization. That nucleus domain typically came at the C terminus here, extreme C terminus, whereas they were preceded by a long uh, run of repetitive domains usually. Uh, in the central region, and some very characteristic N-terminal domains, which were indicative of secretion. In the uh, simplest case here, you see the signal peptides, which mean that they are going out through the general sec pathway. And here, there were certain other specialized uh, domains or motifs suggestive of other secretory pathways. And so our interest in secretion began. And what's more is that when we looked at these C-terminal tips, we found that there was a certain polymorphism to them. So they seem to be a recombinative event which was constantly changing these tips, even between related strains. And it was not just nucleases, but a variety of other enzymatic domains which could be potentially toxins. Now here are at least three distinct unrelated nucleus groups with several nucleus clades with several families within them. Deaminases, these uh, also target nucleic acid. They are not nucleases, but they modify the bases directly. So here is uh, a deaminase acting on cytosine and deaminating it to uracil. So thus you can change the message of the nucleic acid and uh, be a toxin. Peptidases, uh, again, you can imagine their toxic activity. They can cleave all kinds of proteins in the cell. And uh, totally, we found at least a bottom line of 150 such different C-terminal toxin domains. And some of these proteins can be gigantic, like uh, 
this was this is an old slide but i must say that recently one of the largest proteins is about 50000 amino acids so it has broken the record of any protein size uh, seen in eukaryotes but uh, much of the size doesn't come from this toxin but this uh, central region which uh, suggests that there's something about the central part which uh, makes them variable in size now as i said the tripartite organization implies that they are using different kinds of secretory pathways some of which have been named here which you saw in the table at the beginning of the talk and we'll return to them so they have the central regions which give them their great size and the c terminal region which tends to be a toxin what we found when we looked at their genomic organization and these are diagrams of genomic organization so you have a gene represented by this kind of a box arrow so if there are two genes in something like an operon there'll be two genes adjacent to each other so we found that these toxin genes tend to come together with this uh, second gene which coded usually for a much smaller protein so here they are not shown to scale the genes are not shown to scale uh which we defined a new family as new superfamily which we term the sook superfamily and when we look closer at it uh what we found was that they had a very characteristic structure even though they were diverging very rapidly and that structure defined a pocket and much of that rapid divergence was in this was the residues in this pocket and the divergence in this pocket uh tracked the divergence in the adjacent toxin gene so if you had a change in the toxin then you would correspondingly see a change in the residues in this toxin hence we predicted and these were intracellular unlike the toxin which were which was extracellular hence we predicted that these were what are called immunity proteins which are probably uh, preventing the toxic action of that c terminal moiety so uh, this was one major family just like the diversity of toxins we identified at least 90 distinct groups of these immunity proteins going hand in hand with the toxins the other point which we saw when we looked at the genomic organization was that there were there was this kind of gene organization what one could term the complete gene uh, with a complete toxin gene and an immunity protein gene here they are shown much more to scale and then there were these cassettes which were like partial genes comprising of only this part which lay somewhere else in the genome usually uh, several kb downstream or a few kb downstream of the main gene sometimes even adjacent hardly a, within uh, 20 to 30 nucleotides and when we looked at strains since we had the luxury by then of genomic sequences from closely related strains we found a polymorphism wherein this tox this c terminus may vary and it implied that there was a recombination going on because there was a region here shown in pink or violet uh which was extremely similar unlike the toxin and immunity part immunity pro protein genes which were very divergent so it suggested that there was a gene conversion like recombination uh, in the similar part which was getting these things now very remarkably even before we had done this work people had known these regions in the genomes to be hot spots of recombination so that name which you saw in the earlier slide uh the rhs repeat in fact it acquired its name from recombination hot spot so this suggested to us that uh, what was going on here was a polymorphism through active recombination and uh, these toxin tips were constantly changing uh, whereas the secretion part and the repeat part remained more or less constant so what could this mean now there were some distinct features which we found unlike the colisins which are usually uh, not encoded on the chromosome but they are found on plasmids and for the colisins to get out uh, 
the cell needs to lice. So a subset of cells need to sacrifice themselves to release uh, that toxin. But here we found no evidence for anything like that. <coughs> Instead, what we found here was that they are chromosomally uh, encoded. So it made them very good candidates for this phenomenon of kin recognition. And the way we posit it as happening is like this. If two bacteria here colored with the same toxin and immunity protein are kin, uh, then what's likely to happen is that you have the same toxin and the same immunity protein, so you neutralize each other, so you can get along. However, if you have a different toxin and a different immunity protein, then there will be an exclusion. So in, con in systems where you have contact, like biofilms, you can exclude non-kin. And even in soluble systems, you might be able to exclude non-kin because a subset of these are not anchored to the cell surface, but they, were, they showed signs of clearly being secreted enzymes. But here again, exclusion of non-kin becomes important because uh, you're producing a lot of public goods like siderophores and secreted enzymes, uh, which are processing extracellular material to be taken into cells. So if you have uh, an organism which is a freeloader, which uh, doesn't, which is not a kin and utilizes the uh, siderophore or the secreted enzyme for its own use, then you need to exclude it. And this can help uh, exclusion even in a soluble environment. So uh, thus we saw these as, uh, we did all this work purely computationally. And uh, Independent wet lab studies confirm these findings, and now they have inspired a very vast area of research on this uh, class of toxins known as the polymorphic toxins. So one question which comes up is, how do they get out of the cell? And here is where the different uh, secretion systems, that great diversity of secretion systems becomes important. Now, other than polymorphic toxins, which show that polymorphism, there are other kinds of toxins like those directed against eukaryotic hosts. And one of the first mechanisms which was found to uh, secrete these was what was called the type 1 secretion system. Uh, and that's why it's type 1. It was the first to be discovered. Uh, this is a portrait of uh, it. It has, it can work in the gram-negative uh, cell surfaces, thus it can transcend two membranes, and it's sort of geared for that. In the cytoplasmic side, you have the ABC ATPase, which we will detail. You have a periplasmic body and a bridging domain, and finally a porin, which uh, forms the pore across the outer membrane. Thus, it can traverse both uh, the membranes and the central murine, or the, peptido <clears throat> or the peptidoglycan. Now, the way these operate is based on this ATPase domain that you see right here in the cytoplasm, caricatured here this way. And these ATPase domains are fused to something called the pepain-like peptidase domain. So this is a peptidase domain, just like the signal peptidase, but it's a thiol peptidase, which uh, has a cysteine uh, residue as its active site. So the, this domain captures the polypeptides, which have a secretory tag, and it processes them. And then the ABC ATPase, in an energy-dependent fashion, actively pushes them out of the cell. And there are at least three versions of them which slightly vary. There is a version with no uh, peptidase, which can just directly recognize and push it out. So a variety of toxins like the hemolysin, the E. coli uh, high hemolysin, which targets eukaryotic cell membranes, and the calcium-dependent RTX toxins. So this RTX is a motif uh, found in these toxins, which causes them to fold in a calcium-dependent manner outside the cells. So a variety of toxins are secreted out. Now, how does this ATPase achieve this uh, work? 
When we look closer at these ABCA TPAs, what we find is that they are obligate dimers. So here is one subunit, here is another subunit. And when you look even closer, you find they have this conserved motif called the SGG motif. And here is the ATP. So this SGG motif from one subunit uh, binds the ATP from the other subunit. And in fact, it closely fits the contour of the phosphates and the uh, nucleo and the nucleoside of the ATP molecule. So when the hydrolysis of this ATP happens on, in this subunit, uh, it transmits a change to the other subunit. So what you see is an uh, alternating hydrolysis process, which causes these to move uh, in a translational fashion. That is, there's an oscillatory fashion, but it, can, it converts that into a translational movement of the permease domain which it is fused to. Thus, it's a very elegant machine of uh, coupling ATP hydrolysis between two uh, P-loop and TPS domains to drive transport. And when we looked uh, in a recent work which we published and to the evolu deep evolutionary history of these a ABC ATPases, we find that these export uh, protein secretion ABC ATPases are nested within a group of transporters. This was previously known, but they are further nested. They are further nested within a vast radiation of ABC ATPases, uh, with their closest sister groups being enzymes like the SUFC and RLII. Now, RLII is a ribosomal ABC ATPase which binds the ribosomal uh, RNA, the large subunit RNA, and is required for separating the two subunits of the ribosome uh, during uh, once the uh, protein synthesis is complete. So it's the release in, involved in the release process post protein synthesis. Whereas SUFC is a chaperone which opens up proteins in order to load ion sulfur clusters. So the origin of these uh, transporters, which include these se secretory enzymes lies within a vast radiation of ABC ATPases, the majority of which are again involved in nucleic acid uh, related functions. So when we go back to the LUCA, the pre LUCA steps are all nucleic, are mostly nucleic acid related. And the SUFC is the one thing which is involved in insertion of these ion sulfur clusters, which are usually associated with membrane associated, membrane linked uh, electron transfer chains, like in respiration or photosynthesis. So uh, <clears throat> what we see here is that it's quite likely that these transporters emerge from these chaperones, uh, especially given the proximity to the membrane in their ancestral function. And uh, this kind of a transport uh, function has been recycled or reused for transport of whole proteins, which essentially amounts to secretion. Now, it, the fact that it has happened in the prokaryotic secretory systems once suggested that it could happen elsewhere. And indeed, it has happened very late in evolution again in the jawed vertebrates. So jawed vertebrates include vertebrates like us. And in our immune system, we see this kind of a mechanism uh, wherein shorter fragments of proteins, peptides, are loaded onto uh, these antigen presenting molecules called the MHC class one molecules. And these present these peptides, which are derived from invaders like viruses uh, to cytotoxic T cells. And once they recognize a foreign peptide, they can kill the infected cell. So the way this, these peptides get secreted out is through the, the TAP1 and TAP2 ABC ATPases. So it's a convergent mechanism to these uh, bacterial secretory systems, which you see in, euca in uh, eukaryotes, specifically in jawed vertebrate immunity. And uh, the other notable factor is that this becomes itself a locus for biological conflicts. And some viruses, like the herpes viruses, specifically inhibit uh, 
this ABC ATPase to prevent their peptides from being displayed on the cell surface. So what this shows is that once you have uh, an energy generating mechanism uh, to facilitate transport, it may be used more than once uh, at very distinct points uh, in evolution. Now, moving ahead, let's look at the next uh, notable secretion system, which is widely used by the polymorphic toxins, the type 2 secretory system. This again, like the ABC secretory system or type 1, uh, is uh, quite important or it, it's restricted to the gram negatives and is quite important in them. Now, the way this operates is that you need an initial secretion across the primary cell membrane through the sex system. So that we saw earlier. So once it has gotten out and that protein can fold in the periplasmic space. So this can transport ultimately something which has been folded post initial secretion across the first membrane. And this system, it has four components. It has an intracellular engine which drives the secretion, uh, which is again based on a P-loop and TPAs, now of a distinct family, which I'll describe shortly, called the PIL-T or GSPE superfamily. Then it has a platform which is embedded in the inner membrane. And that platform is the one on which something called a pseudopilus. So it is like these uh, extensions in bacterial cells, which you see called pili or the pillars, uh, which is assembled on this. And then you have this uh, external channel or the secretin channel, which uh, allows its secretion through the outer membrane. And the way that's done is this effector is captured onto the pseudopilus and in an ATP dependent manner through the action from within the cell by the pill TATPAs, this uh, pseudopilus is projected out bearing the effector at the tip of it. So coming to this, the engine driving this system, the pill T GSP like ATPases, yet again, we see a connection to nucleic acid biology. So these are distinguished from all other P loop uh, and TPases in having a very characteristic N-terminal domain. So they have this dif distinct N-terminal domain in gray, which none of the other uh, P-loop NTPases have. And that domain uh, has this conserved residue called the arginine finger. Again, a conserved arginine, which allows uh, more efficient hydrolysis. It stabilizes the hypercharge state of the phosphate gamma phosphate during hydrolysis, thus making it a more efficient enzyme. So these pill T like ATPases, they at least one copy was there in LUCA. And on the archaeal side, we find them being involved in pure uh, nucleic intracellular nucleic acid processing, akin to a helicase unwinding or translocating RNAs and processing them along with a coupled endoRNAs domain called the pill T N terminal domain or the pin domain. Now, the typical bacterial versions, they are involved in DNA uptake through the DNA uptake pili. So they have an additional domain which binds DNA and they help sucking in the DNA as part of uh, uh, the sexual exchange of DNA or DNA transfer through these pili. So that's one mechanism of competence or the ability to take uh, external DNA into cells uh, for recombination. So interestingly, again, you see this nucleic acid connection, and it looks as though these uh, pill T like ATPases for the type 1 systems were recruited from these nucleic acid uh, uptake and processing enzymes. So again, they emerge within that radiation of nucleic acid processing enzyme. And these were again reused in a second in a further type of secretory system called the type 4 systems, which we'll come to. So they are not only found in the type 2 systems, but also in the type 4 systems, though they play slightly different roles in each of them. Now, uh, I could go on through all the systems, but in the interest of time, I'll just have a few, one 
a couple of more bacterial systems to give a flavor of uh, some interesting evolutionary connections. So going to the gram positive side of things, a very important secretory system conserved or widespread across bacteria of the gram positive type is the type seven system. Now a very well-known human pathogen, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, it delivers several effectors or toxins uh, into its host cells, including human cells like macrophages uh, using this type seven system. And the type seven system has a few essential components. There are two slightly distinct variants of it. There is what you may call the baseline version, which utilizes this FTSK. Now this FTSK, what it is, we'll come to down the line, but for now, just keep in mind that it is, and it has two P loop NTPS domains forming a hexamer. And uh, so it's a hexameric, loop NTPs, which acts as the energy uh, supplying engine driving secretion. So that is the core component. And then there is a channel across the membrane through which the secreted protein passes, which is uh, made up of the uh, ECCD protein, which interestingly has ubiquitin-like domains. These were the first ubiquitin-like domains which we discovered in bacteria which uh, seem to be required for uh, ass the assembly of this um, uh, type 7 secretory system. They have some other membrane spanning components which comprise this uh, complex like ECCD and ECCE and a peptidase for processing the tags, uh, which is a subtilisin like a serine peptidase. And that acts extracellularly in this case unlike the pepain-like peptidases in the ABC system, which act intracellularly. Now, this direct secretion system through type 7, it's the proteins going through it, usually they are marked by a distinctive N-terminal domain known as the ESAT or WXG100 domain. And uh, th this is an alpha helical globular domain, which acts as the tag which is recognized and secreted out with whatever else it comes with. The second mechanism through which things can go through this system involves a further NTPS driver called ECCA. This ECCA is a distinct type of P-loop NTPS belonging to the A plus uh, clade of P-loop NTPSs. And that uh, can probably even deal with things which are non-WXG. And the exact role of this has been a bit controversial. There's a widespread uh, notion in the literature that the, this is the engine in itself driving the uh, export through this wing of the pathway. But I suspect, based on a variety of lines of evidence, that even in this case, the ECCC-like engine is likely to be required. And this is merely keeping the protein unfolded. Uh, for easy passage. It's a sort of a gatekeeper which is driving it into this uh, pore after which this engine can pump it out. Now, when we look at ECCA, it has two distinct uh, regions, a C-terminal domain, which is the A plus ATPS domain, and an N-terminal region comprised of six TPR repeats. And these form a horseshoe or a um, C-shaped, a half toroidal structure, which is likely the one capturing those uh, peptides or keeping binding to them once unfolded. Whereas the ABC, sorry, the A plus ATPs forms a hexamer. So for each of these, you'll have one of these domains. And uh, the peptide is extruded through these, the central pore. Now, similar A plus ATPases have been recruited for some other secretory systems like the type 6 and the PVC, that's photorhabdus virulence cassette secretory systems, and convergently in some eukaryotic trafficking systems. Uh, in all these cases, its primary role seems to be unfolding and disassembly. At least in the case of type 6 and PVC, we know it's not per se the engine which drives secretion. These systems are spring-loaded, so their default state is to 
secrete things out. But once that's done, they are in an inactive state which needs to be disassembled so that they can come back together again. And that's where the, AB, the AA plus ATPase acts. Now, the type 4 is the last such system which I'll discuss. And it combines features of type 8, uh, sorry, type 7, and the type 1 system. Now, the components which it seems to have from the type 7-like systems are these two ATPases, which form hexameric rings, VIRB4 and VIRB4. And what ATPs resembles the type 1 systems is VIRB11, a Pilti, GSP-like ATPs. Beyond that, it has, again, a cytoplasmic platform and a periplasm and outer membrane uh, penetrating complex made up of the proteins from VIRB6 to 10. Uh, they make up both of these. And uh, these, again, form a conduit similar to those which we have seen in other gram-negative secretory systems. So these are dominant in the gram-negative situation. They also have a pilus, but unlike the py pseudo pilus of the type 1 on which the effector is borne out, here the pilus does not seem to be the one which is bearing the effector. It instead seems to be just involved in adhesion to the target cell. So it helps sticking to the target or the target cell for delivery. And the way this works is that is a multi-step process. There is an initial capture by the gatekeeping ATPase VIRB4, which then pumps it to VIRB11, the PIL-T GSPE-like ATPase, which then delivers that into the channel for secretion. And VIRB4 possibly acts as the pump which gets it across thereafter. Now, when we looked at the evolutionary history of these uh, ATPases, we found we established for the first time several years ago a common origin for type 7 and type 4 8, and both of the type 4 ATPases, that is the uh, VIRD4 and the VIRB4 like groups. And further, we could unify them with FTSK. Uh, which we will see shortly what it's all about, and uh, hair A, which is conserved across archaea, whereas FTSK is conserved across bacteria. Moreover, it seemed to also unify with a large number of packaging ATPases of various viruses. So, what that is, we'll come to in a moment. Now, what FTSK does is to pump bacterial chromosomes after replication. So as you can see, the cells have divided, and it's a fluorescently labeled DNA. And you can see that the DNA from this lower cell uh, is being pumped into that other cell at this after they assemble at this, uh, uh, what is called the septum where the cell division ring is forming. So this physical pumping of the chromosome is carried out by FTSK in bacteria during segregation. So it's pretty remarkable that the chromosome pump is related to these secretory uh, components of type 7 and type 4. And the way these ATPases are organized is again as a toroid and they extrude their uh, substrate through the central channel. And uh, another point to note is that they have this arginine finger at the rear end. So if this is the, the P loop or the Walker A motif, Walker B motif, the bound NTP, the arginine finger is here. So you may ask, how does this arginine finger uh, manage to facilitate catalysis? That's why you have this torus. So the arginine finger from one subunit it is adjacent to the active site from the next subunit. That's how the, this rear arginine finger stabilizes the torus and allows a potential toroidal or a circular movement, which is uh, behind this pumping process. Now, as I mentioned, just to go back, 
uh, these are also related to these viral DNA packaging enzymes. So a variety of viruses like adenoviruses, NCLDVs, which include the pox viruses, and uh, several archaeal viruses and phages like the corticoviruses and tectiviruses. All of them utilize such an ATPase related to FTSK and the type 7 and type 4 ATPases to get the DNA into these shells. So there is something called a loading complex assembled once the shell is made and the DNA is pumped into them. And the interesting thing with all these four, that is this group of viruses, is when you look at them, they are not just a protein shell, but they have an internal lipid bilayer inside the protein shell. So in a sense, they are almost an intermediate between a protein shell, a pure protein shell virus, to a cell which has uh, a lipid membrane around it. And it, this pumping enzyme, in this case, pumps it through that is, it assembles on the protein shell and it pumps it through this lipid membrane into the interior. It pumps the DNA into the interior of these uh, viral uh, particles. So this suggested to us that the emergence of these type 7 and type 4 systems has gone hand in hand with this process of chromosome segregation in cellular life. And the way we envision it is that in the earliest period, there were probably protein shells only, which uh, are like today they survive in the form of the adenoviral systems. And then you had a lipid membrane inside it, which you see in NCLDVs and corticoviruses. And this lipid membrane alone is what characterizes the cellular life with uh, FTSK doing this job. But in cellular life, you also have these selfish elements, both plasmids and conjugative transposons, several of which get out into the target cell through a similar pumping apparatus, which is the ancestor of these uh, type 4 and type 7 systems. And once one of the issues in this kind of secretion is that you have some replication enzymes which are covalently linked to the DNA being transferred. And uh, they are transferred through this transfer apparatus in an unfolded state. So that probably gave the pre-adaptation by which uh, these things could be secreted out from uh, the cell. Uh, proteins could be secreted out, founding these uh, new secretory systems like uh, type 7 and type 4. So just to summarize, when we look at LUCA and we look at how predict how many of the uh, versions of these N different P-loop NTPases, which can be traced back to LUCA, are nucleic acid associated, we find that there is a significant fraction, the majority fraction of them tend to be nucleic acid associated. So these give us some kind of a hint into the very early period of evolution and suggest that nucleic acid related roles were likely dominant. And this ability to uh, manipulate nucleic acids was the pre-adaptation which allowed them to uh, take up roles in proteins to drive protein secretion. And if you look at the whole P-loop NTPA superfamily, you find that across every branch, except those doing phosphotransfer, uh, one or more independent emergences of uh, roles of energy transduction in secretory systems has uh, come about. So. In the end, we can look at all this from a purely thermodynamic uh, viewpoint. In the end, uh, these are energy requiring processes, especially once you establish a boundary, you would need, you need energy to cross that boundary. So ASCII NTPs are specialized in, re, in using the free energy of NTP hydrolysis to uh, drive such secretion. <clears throat> 
And the GTPAs is also use it, but we may see them as doing it in a slightly different way. They are not actively pumping, but uh, you can see them as uh, locking the system in one particular stage. So it's an entropy reduction process uh, which they engage in. And once the system is locked in that state, the natural consequence is to just flow out through the pore. So they are, in a sense, there is the process of reading or editing is itself an energetic process. So uh, you can look at information entropy having some link to uh, the energetic process, uh, the utilization of energy, and the GTPAs uh, uh, sort of embody that. And the diversification of biological conflicts was what you may call the evolutionary driver for the repeated recruitment of these NTPAs as having their roots in nucleic acid manipulation for uh, secretory processes. Now, I think I have a few more minutes, so let me just say a few words about the eukaryotic story. So for eukaryotes, I'll restrict myself to one group of eukaryotic, uh, one clade of eukaryotes, the alveolates. Now, the alveolates are characterized by many uh, parasitic and predatory, as well as some uh, free-living eukaryotes. The parasitic ones include uh, apicomplexins, malarial parasite or toxoplasma and the like, predatory protists like Perkinsanes, and uh, ciliates, most of which are free-living. And what they are all characterized by is a special membrane and uh, subcellular, that's a sub external membrane. It's just below the membranous system, below the cell membrane, uh, in the form of, uh, which is called this alveolar membrane. And all of them have uh, some interesting secretory, specialized secretory apparatus, which we'll touch upon in some more detail shortly. And the apicomplexins themselves, they are parasites. So they have a cycle wherein they go from host to outside after mating, and then they return to a host. And in many cases, uh, this can be uh, more complex. So the simplest case is they just go through one host. But in other cases, they can go through an, a definitive host and an intermediate host, like, say, uh, Plasmodium, the malarial parasite, where the definitive host is the uh, mosquito and vertebrates like ourselves are the intermediate host. So in each of these uh, hosts, the interaction with the host involves the specialized secretory process through a body of weaponry, which are termed extrusomes. Now, extrusomes can discharge physical proteinic we weaponry like this, uh, highly structured objects. Uh, these are in some basal plants and chromis. Now, in ciliates, they are in the form of these spear like objects, trichocysts. And in the case of uh, apicomplexins and perkinsades, there could be even small molecules and toxins which they deliver, as you can see here. Now, this is a study of uh, two protists, two ciliate protists interacting, didenium and plasmodium. And in this study, they showed that one key factor is that at the time of discharge, at the time of secretion, in both cases, so in this conflict, both of them are discharging their trichocysts. And that discharge is associated with an increase in calcium levels. So that pointed us to the possibility that calcium uh, signaling could be a very uh, important factor in, the, in regulating secretion in these eukaryotic systems. And using a comparative genomic approach, looking for alveolate-specific conserved calcium-binding proteins, uh, we uncovered this class of EF-hand domain proteins, uh, at least two groups of them, uh, which by one of which are related to the centrins, which bind calcium, as you can see here, uh, which uh, we predict to be regulators of this calcium-dependent reg uh, secretion regulation. Then, using this similar comparative genomics approach, we asked the question of what 
are common to all alveolates uh, which could be involved in these secretory processes. And we had one anchor in the form of mass spec studies on these secretory organelles, the rope trees and the micronemes of AAPI complexes. So we knew something about what was there in them, but then we used comparative genomics to ask what is common to all alveolates. And we identified a bunch of molecules uh, which suggested potential for several interesting processes like uh, potassium channels indicating an ionic signal as part of the secretory process, uh, membrane components, including with EF hands, which bind calcium, suggesting that calcium link again, A plus ATPases, so the ATPase engine for driving uh, tra or unfolding proteins for their transport, and membrane perforation proteins, which are likely to form that bridge to perforate the eukaryotic membrane of the target to get the um, toxins into them. But the components of the extrosomes, what are actually being secreted, they show no vertical uh, conversation. Now, just to touch up briefly on the evolution of one of these components, uh, this MAC perforin complex, it got its name first from the vertebrate complement system where this domain, a protein with this domain, plays a role in perforating target cells as part of our own immunity. Uh, but they have a deep history going back to bacteria, and they are found in some intracellular bacterial pathogens like chlamydia, uh, which may use them to perforate the, their host cell membranes. And it's interesting that the API complexins appear to have acquired these from such a bacterial uh, component, suggesting that there was exchange between intracellular pathogens which seeded this MAC perforin-like protein in the, in the eukaryotic world. Uh, but in terms of what are actually delivered, you can have a, variety, a great variety. Uh, so you could have small molecule toxins which are deployed by some ciliates. You can have animal type adhesion domains which uh, API complexins uh, deploy. Uh, and uh, in the case of toxoplasma and plasmodium, there are several protein kinases which seem to be effectors uh, which can modify the host cell behavior which are deployed through these secretion systems. So the eukaryotic approach has been quite different. They don't have all the great diversity which uh, at the face of it in terms of the many types of secretion systems in uh, prokaryotes. But they have a complex endomembrane system which allows them to uh, evolve uh, dedicated organelles for secretion, like the extrosomes. And the, the secretion through this uh, vesicular process of vesicles being uh, 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 fusing within the endomembrane system until final secretion, uh, that is mediated through GTPases again, but of a different clade, the RAB, ARF, like GTPases. And uh, the expansions of these, which we see in eukaryotes with an active secretory uh, system, is suggestive of uh, that being the primary mechanism through which eukaryotes innovated uh, their secretory apparatus. So let me stop there, and I can take any questions if you have the time. Thank you, Alvin. Uh, anyone would like to make a question right away? Can go with the. It's a very nice, extensive presentation. So, Ethel, you could start. Thank you, Arvin. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you. So I don't want to spoil your, your presentation, but I was very curious to know your thoughts about the membranes in the first common ancestor. Do you think it was there or not? Uh, oh, definitely, I think it was there. Uh, the reason for that inference is very simple. Uh, the fact 
that we have uh, those in the sex system, which can be traced back to the LUCA. We have those three proteins, which are clearly membrane proteins. They are hydrophobic. Uh, they have hydrophobic helices. So they are not going to be able to uh, survive in a non-hydrophobic environment, which meant that some type of membrane was there in the LUCA. Now, what we cannot say is what was the composition of that membrane. Uh, was it a ester-based linkage, ether-based linkage, or some other kind of micelle, uh, lipid micelle, uh, completely different from these? Um, that we don't know. But we can definitely infer that there was a hydrophobic membranous uh, uh, boundary for the LUCA cell. Thank you. You're welcome. And what about the viruses? You seem to suggest that the internal membrane of those uh, viruses, you took an example for the FTSK-like family. Yeah. That, that would be like a derived state. Yeah, so my current thinking, uh, of course, there's a lot of speculation here, but I'll lay it out in here, is that perhaps the earliest life was uh, viral, or viral meaning virus-like, having a protein shell as the boundary. And that protein shell periodically opened up, and thus it could take in raw materials, and then it closed up. So there was an assembly-disassembly cycle. And that was followed by the emergence of a membrane within that protein shell. So in a sense, like in archaea, you have the S layer, which is a proteinic uh, coat outside the uh, lipid membrane. You can imagine the viral coat being, uh, the protein coat inside a membrane being comparable. So in that case, there was no disassembly of the whole cell, so to say. The outer coat may periodically disassemble or it may have pores for things to pass uh, back and forth. But uh, uh, in the earlier stage, when it was only protein, you would have to envisage a scenario of assembly and disassembly. Anyone else? Do you yeah. have time for some more questions? Oh, sure, sure. I'm, I'm fine. Go ahead. Please. May I? Yeah. yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the amazing talk. Thank it's you. It's very good. And um, I have one uh, question about what do you think um, about the ATPases, uh, that some of them are involved in the polymerization, as in the case, for example, of field B, or the ESPE in the type 2 secretion system that's correlated with pill T that's related with the depolymerization of the pillars in the type 4 uh, pillars machinery. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I think the pill T group is actually quite versatile. So, they may act the NTP hydrolysis could be used in more than one way, either in projection of the pseudopilus or in breakdown of an existing pilus. So it can act in both ways. And I think the key there is how that energy, uh, the free energy is coupled to the downstream process. So you could strike an analogy with A plus, wherein in some cases the A plus enzymes are involved in disassembly of a complex uh, through an, through partial unfolding, probably. Yeah, but in some cases, they may be needed for assembly or driving the secretion. So I think the energy uh, say generation step is what is conserved, but it's like an engine. You can couple it for either breaking something down or you can couple it for building something up. So uh, that is a secondary step. And that depends on the, the type of coupler which has evolved, the, the type of coupling that has evolved with uh, 
the substrates, the other protein partners and substrates. Great. So, because in just one more question, it's because in the type two secretion system, they mm -hmm. only polymerize, and uh, as soon as I know, they don't depolarize the the pseudopilus. That is different in the case of type four pillars that you have one ATPase is specialized just to polymerization and another mm -hmm. to depolymerization. And uh, do, you, yeah. do, you, do you think it's possible that you can have only one ATPase that can process the both steps, polymerize and de despolymerize? I think ancestrally that may have been the case. And the way they would have shifted uh, could have been either due to chemistry, that is, it's a concentration driven thing. If the polymer concentration uh, increases, then the reaction tends to run in the reverse. Whereas if the free uh, monomer concentration is higher, it runs in the forward direction. So it could be a simple uh, concentration affair, or there could be a switching uh, adapter, which could have coupled one of the partners which could have coupled the ATPase to a forward direction step uh, of polymerization in one case and uh, depolymerization in the other. OK. Uh, thank you. And it's very interesting to know that the pill T seems to be uh, faster than the other because of the gain of a glutamate. Is it correct? It is uh, so, so all of the the whole ASCII clade, if I can share my screen again, uh, you're seeing my screen, right? Yes, I can see. Uh, so if you look at, uh, I don't know why it's uh, stuck here. Yeah. So this whole ASCII group, they all have an additional glutamate. So Pilti, as you know, it has it in the form of, I think, a GE motif in this uh, Walker B region. And uh, in the case of uh, these guys, it is DE in the, uh, sorry, in the FPSK Hare family, it's DE. In Pilti, it's GE. And it's DE for most of them. ABC, it's DE. A, it's DE, helicase, it's DE. Now, rec A, it's slightly different in that uh, not all of them have that E in the same place. So that E has evolved convergently in more than one place. And some of them use potassium uh, to bring in a further ion. And that's uh, an alternative to having that E. Is, am I making sense? Yeah, we lost yeah. our screen. Uh, are, are you seeing any screen of mine now? or No, just a bl black screen. <laughs> oh, OK. It may be that sometimes I, I just minimize it so that I can see who is asking the question. Yeah, yeah, but I, I yeah. saw. I saw. Thank you very much. No it, is, it, is, it is interesting because it seems that the, in the case of type 4 pillars, maybe the polymerization process is slower than the depolymerization process. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, this can, um, maybe the reason why the system has two different ATPases is to be the, to be the, to have the depolymerization quicker. It's mm -hmm. quite, quite interesting. It's it, very nice. One possibility is that you have that for, uh, for rapid sticking and De and coming off. So it sticks to the target and then uh, decouples. It sticks and, re and decouples. Perhaps that is something which you need. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. That's all. If we still have time for another question. Sure, uh, sure. Go, go ahead. So, Aravind, I don't follow the literature on evolution, so it's not my strength. But I got curious to know uh, how or what are the thoughts of the field? How do you get from a nucleic acid replicator into a membrane-bound 
ancestor that has the sac components on the membrane. How how that happened? That's a black hole for me. See, the, uh, the main point I'm making is that these are nucleic acid uh, unwinding or translocating enzymes. So that activity transferring to a protein for unwinding a protein or driving the protein across the membrane is uh, probably not a big step because in the end, it's just breaking some hydrogen bonds, uh, whichever substrate you have. And what you need is a binding domain, usually. So like when you look at the example of SEC A, uh, let me see if I can pull that up um, quickly. Uh, right here. So what you see is that this core part is uh, inherited from a nucleic acid helicase. And the way the nucleic acid is bound uh, is usually on this interface. So you see it, uh, the nucleic acid is like this. But what has happened here is it has acquired this additional domain through an insertion. And this is a further C-terminal domain. So these act as an adapter that now a protein can be engaged. So such changes are the more you can see such changes as being the more general mechanism by which a core such as uh, the helicase which uh, one second sorry which operates on a nucleic acid uh, this core can be adapted to now work on a protein and I believe that the way the, in, the intermediate step for this are things like the selfish elements which we see today, the, uh, like say a type four system wherein uh, the replicator protein, the, the rep protein uh, is covalently bound to the nucleic acid which is being transmitted uh, into, a, into the target cell. So am I, am I making sense? Yes, I got it now. Thank you. I got lost about the topology. I mean, if you look at the DNA pumping family, the FTSK like, yeah, you mostly get examers. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure about SEC A and other, I mean, ATPAs that are now involved in transport. Okay, to go very quickly, uh, one second, it's unstable. Okay, so uh, let's go systematically. A plus the dominant uh, topology, uh, dominant uh, stoichiometry is hexamers. Sometimes you can get heptamers and pentamers too, but most transport versions are all hexamers. Uh, ABC, always a dimer. It's obligately a dimer. Helicases, they are either monomers or dimers. If they are dimers, it's just that there are two of them acting in tandem uh, on either side. But sec A is for most part monomeric. Uh, rec A, can form hexamers or uh, helical filaments. That is, it doesn't complete one circle as a hexagon, but it just goes on along the z-axis uh, like a helix. Pilty seems to be, uh, it ha it's capable of functioning as a monomer by itself, but it can assemble into multimers of that self-sufficient monomer. Uh, ty type 4, type 7, uh, hair AFTSK superfamily, always uh, uh, toroidal rings, mostly hexamers. Making sense? Yes, yeah. yeah. I see, it's much more limited in a specific Twitch family. Yes. It's superfamily. Right, I think. Uh, we are going very late because 
It was a very dense, very good presentation. Thanks a lot, Aravind. Thank you. And just asking if somebody else has any question. Perhaps we can forward it to uh, Aravind. So we won't take more of his time. Thanks, Robson. And uh, I'll I'll talk to you later. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you're around, you said you will be around after. Yeah, after we we are yeah. done with this, we're now yeah. discussing. Uh, we're gonna make a break and discuss mm -hmm. a, an article. After mm -hmm. that, I'll be free. Okay, so we can touch base later today. I'll talk to you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Have a nice day, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Yeah. Thank Bye. You very much. It was a very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. So stop recording. I can remember where. There. Yeah.